Since the domestication of plants and animals has been the central issue in the minds of most researchers, it has been the focus of much of the literature, both specialist and popular. So this is where we should start. Most archaeologists and most uh, other specialists have uh, concern themselves with the second question on the screen here, though they don't usually phrase it quite like that. But there is a first question, how to develop strategies of subsistence in support of a more sedentary lifestyle in larger groups. And I think that the answer to the second question then follows on from my first question. What we shall see is that Epipaleolithic communities in Southwest Asia began to live in a different way from all their predecessors, in large, permanent, and more and more sedentary communities. And that way of life was supported on a radically different set of subsistence strategies. So now let's go and see how we should frame our inquiry into Epipaleolithic subsistence strategies. Child dramatized the contrast between hand-to-mouth hunter-gatherers living from day to day, dependent on nature's bounty, and noble farmers, who through their honest labor were productive and therefore could begin to take a long-term perspective on their future and use some of their time for doing things beyond the, the basic food quest. In the 1960s, Kent Flannery's broad-spectrum revolution theory made the adoption of farming an inevitable consequence of an earlier change, an earlier revolution. In his view, when hunter-gatherers turned to living more sedentary lives, they unwittingly started a trend to increasing population. And when population grew to the extent that the available wild food resources came under pressure, the solution was to intensify the productivity of those resources, in other words, to farm them. For Flannery, farming was the solution to a problem that had arisen because of earlier changes within hunter-gatherer strategies. So the earlier change to a broad spectrum strategy was the revolution for, for Flannery. <coughs> Kent Flannery and his co-director Frank Hole chose an intermontane valley in the Zagros chain in southwest Iran in the hope of building a cultural sequence at least from the Upper Paleolithic through the Epipaleolithic to the Neolithic, something that had sadly eluded uh, uh, Robert Braidwood. In the cave sites and the rock shelters, <coughs> they found a, a Middle Paleolithic, an Upper Paleolithic, and an Epipaleolithic occupation in, in a series of uh, uh, rock shelters, and I include the, the culture names here just for fun. <coughs> In the cave sites and rock shelters, so they found the, the, the three periods, but not the Neolithic. And when they moved their operations out onto the alluvial plain in southwest Iran, very close to the frontier with Iraq, they found mounded occupation sites which dated to the early Neolithic onwards. So they had their sequence. What did it show them? Well, there was almost no change between the animal bones which they could pull out of the middle Paleolithic and upper Paleolithic but between the Upper Paleolithic and the Epipaleolithic, there was a difference. The numbers of bones of small mammals, such as fox and hare, and of uh, birds and tortoises and frogs and fish, increased impressively in the Epipaleolithic levels. The great majority of bones still represented the large herd ungulates that had always been the main prey of hunter-gatherers. There was no direct evidence of plant foods in those excavations, but there were numbers of large grinding slabs and, stones and, and uh, stone mortars and some storage pits. So Flannery put the evidence together and argued that the Epipaleolithic groups were harvesting hard-seeded and nutritious plant foods, storing and processing them, and that would indicate that they were spending extended periods living at the sites, unlike their predecessors. If they were staying around, they couldn't be ranging so far in pursuit of the large game, so they were compensating by catching many smaller animals, birds, fish, and so forth. So where was the revolution in that? Well, Flannery reasoned that if people were storing harvested seeds, they were tending towards sedentism. If the women 
were not obliged to hunt babies around from camp to camp in the, the cycle of mobile hunter-gatherer bands, as before, to the same extent, there would be a reduction in birth spacing. Others have added another factor, that mothers who are breastfeeding do not conceive so readily, and if these groups were using ground cereals, they might wean their infants earlier, and again, a reduction in birth spacing. Thus Flannery concluded uh, that the changes in settlement and subsistence strategy would have led to uh, population growth. And over the centuries, and indeed the millennia, because remember we now know that the Epipaleolithic is thousands of years long, over the centuries and the millennia, even a small reduction in birth spacing would lead to a significant long-term population growth. But the environmental resources would remain more or less finite, the same, because they're hunting and gathering from the wild. So at some point, some people would have to move away to find new territories to start a daughter colony. Within the Zagros mountain valleys, they had a variety of e ecological zones which they could uh, exploit from the base camp, and they could forage down by the river, they could uh, use the lush green uh, valley, uh, they could find different foodstuffs on the valley sides and uh, hunt in the, in the higher parts of the um, mountain ranges. However, locations like that were strictly limited, and colonists who needed more space, if they had too much population, they needed more space, would have to move out onto the alluvial plain, taking with them seed to sow and sheep and goat to herd. Thus Flannery took the story to its conclusion. The broad spectrum revolution carried with it the inevitability that at some stage it would become necessary to take those upland plants and grow them down on the alluvial plain, to take those upland animals like sheep and goat and herd them in terrains where they were not native. Although the broad spectrum revolution idea, which was published in 1968-1969, has been subject, subjected to some fairly hard criticism, some of the basic components of it uh, remain. Around the same time that Hole and Flannery were working in southwest Iran, the French archaeologist Jean Perrault published the first reports of his salvage excavations at the later Epipaleolithic site of Ain Malaha in Arabic, or Ainan, its name in modern Hebrew, in Israel. The site lies in the very far north of uh, Israel, north of the Sea of uh, Galilee, right up in the, uh, uh, just underneath, looming underneath the Golan Heights, in fact. Uh, and very little nowadays uh, survives of Lake Hule, which used to be in that uh, basin. There's some pools and, and uh, things you can see uh, maybe in the picture on your right there, but uh, um, that's all that's left of what was once a lake in the head of the, the valley there. Malaha was beautifully located to support hunting and harvesting. The formal evidence shows that the people of uh, Malaha exploited the lake and its margins for fish, for crabs, for mollusks, for migrant waterfowl in season, and they also had the lush basin around the lake and the hills behind the site. And they were able to hunt gazelle, lots of wild pig, fallow deer, roe deer, and other species. There are wild almond shells, pistachia stones, and some grains of wild cereals. There's plenty of indirect evidence in the form of sickle blades with silica gloss, black basalt grinding slabs, and rubbers, and deep mortars and stone pestles. Malaha was occupied for more than 2,000 years by a community that Jean Perrault um, uh, argued was completely sedentary there all the time for the whole of that period, and he estimated it at around 250 people, which is just as a round figure, roughly ten times the size of the average mobile hunter-gatherer band. So the Epipaleolithic has had a huge effect uh, over that uh, time in the way people lived together. In the right location, permanent sediment sedentism was possible for well-adapted hunter-harvesters, clearly. Archaeologists have tended to treat this final phase of the Epipaleolithic as somehow untypical of the period as a whole. And we'll look at the culture of these southern Levantine communities in the next uh, lecture a little more closely, uh, but uh, they were indeed new and different to some extent, <coughs> but it was more a matter of degree in the late Epipaleolithic period than of appearance of something completely new. In the last few years, we've been hearing of some 
very interesting discoveries, but none so remarkable as the site on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, Ohalo II. I never found out what Ohalo I is, but Ohalo II uh, um, is there. And also on that map you can see where uh, Malaha Ainan uh, is. Ohalo II was found when the summer water level in the Sea of Galilee was at an unusually low level. It was uh, uh, sometime in the, uh, I think it was 1989 or, or early 90s when it was uh, uh, noted. It was situated on a former shoreline and is dated uh, fully 20,000 years ago in the last glacial maximum, therefore. In archaeological terms, it lies at the boundary between the conventional uh, between the conventional Upper Paleolithic and uh, Epipaleolithic. We shall look at some of the archaeological features of the remarkable waterlogged site in the next lecture, but here I want to concentrate on the subsistence strategies. The people at, who lived at Ohalo harvested wild cereals and wild pulses, but altogether they collected and processed the seeds of more than 120 species of plant. This is because the site has got uh, um, inundated by the Sea of Galilee. It's a, a very uh, powerful tectonic region, the, the Jordan Valley and all up and down that Rift Valley. It's a continuation of the Rift Valley which goes down the Red Sea and through uh, East Africa. Uh, so it's tectonically very, uh, very vigorous uh, and conditions have changed. But because the place has become waterlogged, we have quite remarkable plant remains, uh, say 120 species. There's heavy groundstone equipment, found at the site and on one which has recently been, uh, whose surface has recently been analysed using new analytical techniques, they found traces of particular plant starches which show that that's indeed what it was being used for. There's been an argument by purists, oh well the grinding stones, maybe they were grinding ochre, maybe they were making paints, maybe they were making eyeshadow, all sorts of things, what you'd be doing making eyeshadow with grinding stones this big, I don't know, <laughs> but anyway now at Ohalo Israeli scientists have been able to show that the starches are ground into the surface of the grinding stone. The stored cereals, grasses, pulses and other seeds imply that people were there from early summer for several months and there is information about the seasons when animals and birds were hunted or trapped that shows some of them were migrant. Some of the young animals they can tell, say at what age they were in their first year of life that they were killed and together with the plant uh, information it shows that the people were using this site all year round, even if they were not in residence year in, year out for a hundred years. But when they were there, they were using it uh, uh, full time. There's the heavy uh, grind, groundstone equipment, the seasonality evidence, and then in some parts of Southwest Asia, we see broad spectrum hunting, and now we add in the information from Ahalo, harvesting and storage of grasses, cereals, pulses carried on over more than 10 millennia. So we are in a position now to answer the first question that I had uh, on the screen earlier on at the beginning. What strategies of subsistence were needed to support a more sedentary lifestyle in larger groups? Well, if hunter-gatherers uh, were to move less frequently and stay for a season or for most of a year or eventually for whole years in one place, they needed to adjust their hunting strategies. Instead of following the herds of gazelle or deer, they needed to compensate by maximizing their take from the area around their base camp. And that meant trapping birds, catching small mammals such as hares, foxes, catching tortoises, frogs, lizards, snakes, fish. And there would uh, be locations which would suit such a broad spectrum strategy. Locations which had ready access to a variety of different ecological zones, complementary ecological zones. What we should note is that there is not a simple balance, a simple equation between increased reliance on broad, broad spectrum hunting and uh, reduced mobility. <coughs> the, uh, uh, if you employ a greater reliance on small game birds, reptiles, fish and so on, it, you do so at the expense of greatly increased investments of time and skill and equipment per kilogram of meat you obtain. Epipaleolithic uh, uh, gatherers harvested many kinds of grasses as well as the available wild cereals. They also harvested wild pulses such as lentils and peas, but also various kinds of vetches, 
The evidence from field botanists is that pulses did not grow in the wild in dense stands. Experimental harvesting of wild pulses in Israel has produced quite horrifying figures of the amount of time it takes to uh, obtain even quite small quantities uh, of uh, seeds. Many of these store seeds then required extensive processing. The cereals, as we know, needed to be threshed and the grain needs to be milled or at least broken. And there is evidence from the skeletons buried at the site of Abu Huraira that adult females conspicuously had joint damage and arthritis in ankles and knees, which is attributed to hours each day spent on their knees rocking backwards and forwards with the uh, heavy grindstones. Some of the species of vetches which were widely used needed processing to remove toxins before cooking. So reliance on stored harvests, harvests involved a considerable cost in terms of labour and effort and time. These changes to subsistence strategy, I want to emphasise, were not something that happened shortly before the first farmers domesticated plants or animals. By the end of the Epipaleolithic, in at least some parts of Southwest Asia, hunter harvesters, as I prefer to call them, had lived as seasonally shifting, semi-sedentary and even fully sedentary communities for many millennia. And it involved a major change in way of life requiring planning and a great investment of uh, additional labour. Now let's turn to the second set, uh, question. Why did successful epipaleolithic communities, and if they managed to, this way of life for 10 millennia, then they were successful, turn to cultivation and herding in the Neolithic? Why were people prepared to invest even more labour in uh, farming and keeping herds of animals through the winter? Was it the need to provide more food than nature could provide? Or was it a downturn in natural resources because of climatic deterioration in the Younger Dryas, which is the fashionable and today the, the orthodox wisdom, which I don't uh, uh, agree with? Are there indicators of, the, of change ahead of the appearance of the first recognisably domesticated species, and where and when have the first signs of domestication of plants and animals been found? And that's what we're going to turn to, and we'll start with uh, plants, and we'll go to the site of Abu Huraira, and I've got a, a part of the rainfall map, which you may recall from uh, yesterday, and there's Abu Huraira on the bend of the Euphrates. It's uh, um, almost due east of uh, Aleppo, uh, on a bend of the Euphrates. Uh, um, and uh, uh, as we saw yesterday, uh, it's uh, very much at the margin of where uh, life could be sustained <coughs> by uh, farming. Uh, it's right in the, in the um, lowest, almost the lowest rainfall. It's a very strange place to have a major site at first sight. But in fact, it's a very cleverly chosen location. On this block diagram, I've put a red blob as to where the site is. It's, it's uh, on a promontory sticking out from uh, the uh, terraces on the side of the Euphrates, sticking out into the floodplain. Uh, and from there, you have access, if you're a farmer, you can farm down on the floodplain with natural irrigation almost natural irrigation. Uh, you can do a bit of farming if you can see the, uh, um, the behind the site there's a, a, a dry valley system coming out of the, or a seasonal uh, water system coming out of the nearly arid uh, interior there. And there's seasonal pasture there too. Yeah? So there's uh, several places where you can farm and pasture your animals uh, if you're a farmer. If you're a hunter-gatherer, again, you're at the, right at the boundary of several different ecological zones. You've got big catfish, in the, uh, in the Tigris and, and uh, uh, freshwater crabs and other mollusks. You've got uh, other kinds of things on the floodplain. You've got the um, seasonal wadi system uh, going back uh, to the uh, west behind the site. And you've got the semi-arid uh, lands around, which were, were at this period full of gazelle at certain periods of the year at any rate. So for either hunter-gatherers or for farmers, it was a good place to, 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 to be, although it has a very low uh, rainfall. This was a 1970s rescue excavation and again just to bring in uh, a, an allusion to something I said yesterday, the botanists and zoologists who came to work on this rescue project came straight out of Eric Higgs early agriculture project in, uh, in Cambridge. This was part of the, the spreading of, of uh, new techniques of recovery, uh, new strategies of uh, rigorous strategies of sampling uh, for faunal and 
plant remains. The problem for the team working there was that they only had two seasons before the dam was completed and the waters rose and drowned the place, and there was a village in the middle of the site, a, scattered a, scatter a village of scattered houses, so their trenches, as you can see in the diagram on the right of the screen, uh, their trenches uh, were scattered all over the place where, where they could uh, put them. But on one tr in one trench, <coughs> their trench E, uh, they found epipaleolithic occupation underneath the, the uh, Neolithic. It's a very big aceramic Neolithic site, uh, but then in just one trench, trench E, uh, there's uh, signs of an earlier epipaleolithic occupation. And here we can look down into, the, um, into trench E and see where they've gone through the uh, aceramic Neolithic, that's the rectilinear architecture at the back of the picture there, and they've gone further down and there is there down to the natural subsoil uh, where epipaleolithic people have repeatedly cut into the subsoil to uh, cut small circular hut bases and lots of post holes and, and so forth. The section drawing of the, of the section at the back of that uh, trench that you could see, you see the stubs of the walls of the uh, of the rectilinear uh, Neolithic house and I put a red line in uh, and below that red line is where the epipaleolithic deposits were, a metre thick of epipaleolithic deposits. The radiocarbon dates show that it occupies about a thousand years, 800 years at the very end of the epipaleolithic and indeed it's in the younger Dryas phase, in that cooler, much drier period at the very end of the, of the Pleistocene uh, uh, that it uh, uh, was occupied. Uh, now, the archaeologists separate the stratigraphy. Archaeologists have a very limited count of ability and they always count to three. Um, they, they've got three subphases in the epipaleolithic, one, two, and three. And so on these diagrams of plants, you'll see one, two, and three, phase one, two, and three. That's the successive stages through this 800 years of epipaleolithic occupation. The first thing I should tell you is that the wood charcoal declines. I haven't got a diagram for that, but the wood charcoal declines. So, the, 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 the evidence is that there's less and less woodland um, uh, trees around the site uh, during this uh, um, period. The amount of wild cereals which they're harvesting declines from phase one through phase two to phase three. So the bigger seeded, preferable cereals are declining in uh, availability during that last phase of the epipaleolithic. And <coughs> In the middle phase, there's an increase in a number of plants which the botanist Gordon Hillman says are um, kind of emergency foods. Then they're, they're certainly not preferable. They involve a lot of processing, an awful lot of effort in collecting, and they're not terribly nutritious. But if you're running out of other things, they're the kind of things which you, uh, uh, you use. So in this diagram, uh, you see a rise in the middle there, and that's the, um, of, if you like, emergency uh, foods. Yeah? And they're the same sort of uh, uh, thing grasses with quite small seeds where you've got to do an enormous amount of collecting and processing to get anything uh, out of it. <coughs> and then there's a, a, another uh, diagram now in which uh, from phase one through phase two to phase three you see a rising uh, um, line uh, uh, and it is of uh, small seeded plants uh, but among them are plants which might well be thought of as seeds, weeds of cultivation, the kind of plants that would grow in disturbed ground. In other words, people have started to cultivate and these plants are accidentally being um, harvested along with the harvest of the first cultivated crop. And in fact, in that third phase, at the very end of the epipaleolithic, and at the very end of the occupation of Abu Huraira in the epipaleolithic, <coughs> there are some grains of rye. And uh, I should have said that uh, uh, the recovery techniques at this two seasons of excavation, two seasons, produced literally tons of botanical and faunal material and it took 23 years to process. Yeah? It occupied the whole career of Gordon Hillman yeah? um, and uh, uh, generations of PhD students yeah? uh, working with him. Um, but again, it's just amplifying a point I was making yesterday about the slow uh, rate of, of uh, progress. But after 20 years and changing his mind three times, Gordon Hillman and his colleagues at the end come down in favour of the um, idea that rye was domesticated um, in, in the final phase of the epipaleolithic at Abu Huraira, the earliest known domestication of a plant 
uh, in uh, Southwest Asia and so far as I know uh, in, in the world. At present, the handful of domesticated rye grains from Abu Huraira, and not everybody accepts his conclusion. Some people say, well, five years earlier he said he was doubtful, and ten years before that he said it was probably wild, and five years before that he said he thought they probably would be able to say it was domesticated. It's very much on the, on the balance. But at present, they're, they're all, all we, uh, we have, and they stand alone and isolated. Not only was Abu Huraira then abandoned uh, and not reoccupied uh, until sometime in the Aceramic Neolithic several hundred years later, uh, but no one else continued to, uh, to cultivate rye thereafter. So it was a, um, a, a dead end anyway. The next examples of domesticated species are uh, of different species. A group of Israeli botanists and archaeologists have suggested that the pulses were the first domesticated cereals, uh, were, sorry, were the first domesticates before the cereals uh, uh, wheat and barley. But the problem is that pulses don't change shape or size particularly with domestication. If you met a wild lentil in the street outside, yeah, you wouldn't know the difference between that and one from Tesco's. Yeah? They're, they're uh, virtually uh, identical in size, and particularly once they've been carbonized anyway. I don't think you're likely to be savaged by wild lentils outside. <laughs> Phew. Uh, but so it's very difficult to say when lentils and, and the other pulses uh, are um, uh, domesticated, though there's some very interesting work going on in Israel just at present um, on this. A, a friend of mine, an archaeologist, Avi Gopher, collaborating with various scientists from different disciplines are, are trying some uh, very interesting new research to see if they can get uh, uh, genetic tabs on um, the changes in uh, lentils and pulses uh, which will show that, that, that they were being uh, domesticated, they were being grown artificially. The grains of uh, um, domesticated cereals are larger than the wild forms, but uh, um, given that size varies, uh, whether you're looking at wild plants or domesticated plants, and plants growing in ideal conditions will produce plumper grains than plants growing in poor conditions, it makes it very difficult to, uh, to tell the difference. There's a, a wild and a domesticated barley on the uh, left of the screen, and then in the middle of the screen we're looking at emma wheat, uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the drawings of seeds, it's the ones on the right that are domesticated as opposed to the ones on the left. Yeah? And again, these have been carbonized and distorted. Uh, it's, it's extremely difficult to, to uh, tell. Unless you go several thousand years into domestication and then it, it, it's quite clear. But at the boundary when things are being domesticated, it's a very difficult to, uh, question to resolve. Scanning electron uh, microscope pictures from um, uh, the botanist at the Institute of Archaeology in London, the uh, einkorn grain on the left is wild and the one on the right is domesticated. She is quite clear about it and to her it's perfectly <coughs> obvious, yeah, but it's, as you can see, you can imagine, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky uh, question. Well, if we can't do grain size, what about the rachis? The rachis is the little bit that connects the seed to the ear. Uh, of uh, uh, grain, ear of wheat or barley. In the wild, wheat and barley have a brittle rachis, so that as when the seed becomes ripe and the plant is, senses it's the time, it sheds its seed. The brittle rachis is brittle, yeah, it becomes brittle, the seed drops off. Yeah. In cultivated, domesticated wheat, when it's ripe and you go into the field, and you pull at an ear of uh, wheat or barley, the seeds do not come off. Yeah? It's got tough rachis. Yeah? So the effect of domestication is to amplify the, uh, a natural variant within the, the species for tough rachis, so it becomes the dominant one uh, and the seeds stay on the ear until the farmer um, has harvested them and threshed them, as indeed they want. Now, so the botanists say, well, if we can find um, brittle rachis along with the seeds, then we know they're wild. If we find tough rachis, in other words, the rachis have been broken by threshing. So they're looking again, these are scanned on the left, these are scanning electron microscope pictures. And Sue College, who, like me, has a degree from Birmingham University and is therefore reliable, 
says that the one on the left is a brittle righteous and the one on the right is a tough righteous and it's broken. Yeah? Uh, uh, again, the problem there is that you need to have an awful lot of seeds if you're to have some righteouses as well because farmers don't particularly want to get and, and bakers don't particularly want to get righteous in. They want to get the grain, clean grain. Yeah? So you don't get many samples where you get enough seeds to have some other fragments of chaff and rachis along with it. Yeah? So it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, tricky. We're going to go to, an, to a site just a bit up the river. On this uh, um, map, um, Abu Huraira, where, which we were looking at before, is now a blue disc. And upstream, close, very close to the, to the uh, frontier with, uh, um, between Syria and, and uh, Turkey, is the site called Jerf al-Akmar, which we'll see more of uh, uh, later on today. A very exciting uh, site. A French excavation, rescue excavation, another dam further back up the uh, uh, Euphrates, which was completed just uh, recently, the Tishreen Dam. And George Wilcox, who doesn't sound very French, but has in fact worked in France all his career, has studied the carbonized plant remains recovered in the excavation of this very early Neolithic settlement in the north of Syria, Jerf al Akmar. Uh, it dates from older than 9000 BC uh, down to about 8500 uh, uh, BC. So it's very, very early in the Neolithic. And it's a stratified site which was occupied over several hundred years. So George Wilcox has been able to study grain samples from earlier and later parts of the stratigraphy. So you've got one site, so if any variation in size will not be because one's grown in a more favorable environment and one's grown in a less, they're all grown in the same area, growing in the same area, just around the site, uh, and he's got uh, uh, a time series. And as a control, uh, he used uh, um, a series of uh, grains from a, an, another uh, site uh, nearby, which was later uh, and certainly uh, cultivated. Uh, here we're looking at einkorn, one of the varieties of wheat which was uh, uh, present in the wild and which was one of the first domesticated forms of wheat. And he's measuring the uh, breadth versus the thickness of his grains. From the early levels, they are open circles. And you'll see that the <coughs> open circles are down towards the lower left size part of the graph, whereas the, um, the later levels have not only some grains which are same size as the early ones, but some which are larger. So he's saying in the late period, by 8500 BC at Jerf al Ahmar, there is a change happening in the size of einkorn um, grains, einkorn wheat grains. Domestication is in progress. And when he puts the average size of Jerf al Ahmar early wheat there as an open circle against the uh, domestic, certainly domesticated wheat from a site which is a thousand, two thousand years later in the same area, you can see that um, they're on, they're, they're, uh, they might be a bit larger than the wild, but they're not yet at anything like the size of the fully domesticated uh, crop. You can do the same thing with barley, and it's actually clearer on this picture. Again, the early period are open circles, the later period at Jerf al Ahmar are the solid uh, black discs. And it's fairly clear that the early, in the early period of Jerf al Ahmar, the barley is smaller. In the later period, it's getting bigger. Yeah? So the process of domestication uh, is uh, underway in those early centuries of the ninth millennium, t late 10th and into 9th millennium uh, uh, BC. And again, he can do the same sort of thing with averages and show you early Jerf al Ahmar as an open disk, later Jerf al Ahmar, bigger. Um, a very nearby site of Jade, which we'll also be seeing more of, um, another French excavation very close by in the valley, uh, at the same sort of date as late uh, Jerf al Akma, and then bigger again, uh, another site a couple of thousand years later, fully domesticated. So the process is underway. So George Wilcox has been able to show that the process is happening uh, and uh, at, at during these centuries. In other words, domestication didn't happen overnight. Yeah? People grew uh, or planted, let's go be clear, people began to plant wild barley uh, and look after it uh, and then save some of the seed and plant it again. Uh, and it's been a question which botanists have been asking for 
at, at least 20, 20 odd years, 20, 30 years, how long does it take for domestication, for, for cultivation to produce the uh, effects on size that George Wilcox has been able to detect? Uh, um, and George himself has run a, a, an experimental uh, series of plots in the Ardèche in the south of France where he's been growing wild einkorn brought from Turkey, from Anatolia, uh, into a fairly similar um, environment. Uh, and he's got a whole series of plots, some which just are allowed to grow naturally, others which are harvested in one way, others which are cultivated where he actually cultivates the ground, sows the seed. Uh, and uh, um, he hoped he would be able to see whether, how long it took to bring those changes, because it was thought first that the changes would come quickly. Uh, but they didn't come. He did it. He was doing it. Been doing it for getting on for 20 years now, and there's really no change uh, in his cultivated barley. But the work he's done with the seed from with the grain from Jerf al Ahmar shows that it actually takes centuries yeah, before the the fully domesticated plant emerges at the end of the process. So now botanists like George Wilcox and a number of others are talking of pre-domestication agriculture. That there's a phase before we can detect the fully domesticated species, yeah, when cultivation has been slowly, slowly changing the, 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 the shape and form of the plant and some of its characteristics. But now we're going to look at animals. And in these graphs, Simon Davis, an archaeozoologist, has been uh, uh, seeking to define shifts in the animal species that were hunted through the last part of the Paleolithic and into the early Neolithic. He talks of two shifts, the first of which consisted of a growing reliance on hunted gazelle among the larger herd animals which were hunted. And this is what this series of graphs shows. These graphs start at around 54,000 years ago, near the end of the Middle Paleolithic. At that time, when Neanderthals was probably still around in, the, in the, um, this part of the world, Southwest Asia, uh, when Homo sapiens was also around by this time. Uh, there were still, at the right-hand end of the graph, you probably can't make out the species at the bottom, but there are rhinoceros, aurochs, wild cattle, um, wild equids, wild horses, um, other kinds of uh, uh, equids which are larger than donkeys and, and about the size of small horses, red deer, and so forth. So there were some quite large uh, um, herd animals uh, hunted in the late middle Paleolithic. When you get to the 25, 20,000 years ago is the last glacial maximum were fully, were at the end of the upper Paleolithic, beginning of the Epipaleolithic uh, in uh, the terms of Southwest Asia. Then you can see those columns on the right hand side of the graph, the rhinoceros, wild cattle, and so forth, they've gone. Simon Davis is looking at sites in Israel, so we're looking at the South Levant, just to give you the, the region we're, we're, uh, we're looking at. Uh, and uh, um, the, num the volume of red gear that they're hunting is quite important. The left-hand column is gazelle. That's the one that you can see as you go up through the graph, the left-hand column is gazelle. Insignificant in the middle Paleolithic, becoming the most hunted animal in the uh, upper Paleolithic, Epipaleolithic boundary, and it goes on. If we go into the middle of the uh, um, Epipaleolithic period, uh, you can see other animals beginning to drop out, gazelle becoming more important. Here we're coming towards the end of the uh, Epipaleolithic, and gazelle is the totally dominant species. Now, you may not have met a gazelle, uh, but it's small. Yeah? They're small. They don't provide very much more meat than a, than a wild sheep. Yeah? So, in other words, people are going down the range. The bigger animals are getting hunted out. They're relying more and more uh, on gazelle. And when we get to the end of the graph there, right at the top, at just the boundary between Epipaleolithic and Neolithic, end of the Younger Dryas into the Neolithic, there you can see gazelle are almost the only animal along with roe deer, and again you'll know roe deer are small. Yeah? So they're relying heavily on actually small herd animals. So there's a process of shift going on through the Epipaleolithic towards greater and greater reliance on gazelle. This is the same samples, but looked at in a different way. What Simon Davis is doing here is uh, looking at the ratio of immature animals with unfused bones to mature animals. Yeah? So on the scale on the left-hand side of the graph is 10, 20, 30% of immature animals with unfused bones. 
and you can see that from 50, it's the same samples as he was using before, from 50,000 middle Paleolithic, 25,000 last glacial maximum middle of the upper Paleolithic, epipaleolithic beginning through the epipaleolithic is 20% of the animals that they're hunting are, have unfused bones, they're young gazelle. And what you see quite clearly is that at the end of the graph there, around 10,000 and into the early Neolithic, the percentages of gazelle which are being hunted, when gazelle is the only animal they've got, big meat animal they've got, yeah, the percentage of smaller animals is rising very sharply. That's not good news for gazelle. Yeah, and ultimately it's not good news for the hunters either. Yeah. So that's the second shift that Simon Davis is talking about. It's a general shift towards gazelle, and then when at the end of the epipalmy, the beginning of the Neolithic, when gazelle is the only animal, then they're overhunting. They're substantially overhunting. Simon Davis also worked on a, on a particular site called Hatula uh, in Israel, which has two occupation phases. One at the, don't re pay any attention to the radiocarbon dates, these are uncalibrated radiocarbon dates on this diagram but one is at the very end the lower one is at the very end of the epipaleolithic and the tall column is gazelle and then the next one is uh, uh, just a few hundred years later when the, the same site is reoccupied in the early neolithic the Acer early in the aceramic neolithic and you can see what they're doing they're hunting a broad spectrum they've gone really really broad spectrum they've no longer got enough gazelle uh, and uh, <coughs> they're having to, to um, hunt fox and cat and badger and polecat and hare and hedgehog and then off the left hand side of the main graph for the PPNA period as it's called you'll see there's big columns for birds and fish and particularly the column for fish is so big it won't fit on the graph yeah? now the thing about this is this site is not anywhere near the coast and the fish they're, they're catching are marine the large marine fish so these people um, are having to tramp to the coast. It's about 12, 15 kilometers to the coast. Yeah? Do some marine fishing for quite large fish and then bringing them back to the site. Yeah? So there's the signs of, of deep stress on resources increasing through the Epipaleolithic and becoming uh, really serious at the, uh, um, in the early, into the early Neolithic. <clears throat> this diagram uh, um, is just showing us that uh, comparative uh, weight sizes. Uh, let's take a hair because uh, the second one down, the, um, <coughs> it uh, gives you about the same amount of uh, meat as a tortoise, which is the third one down, uh, if you can catch it. Yeah? And that's about one kilogram. Uh, a small game, like gazelle, give you 20, 50 kilograms of meat per animal. If you can get red deer and, and, and bigger animals, 80 to 200 kilograms, if there were large game around in southern Levant at this time, if you could hunt wild aurochs, wild cattle, 200 to 800 kilograms per animal hunted. Yeah? So you've got to catch a lot of hares or a lot of tortoises uh, or even a lot more game birds um, to, to get the meat supplied. <coughs> Uh, this is the work of a, an American archaeozoologist, Natalie Munro, who's focused on smaller animals in general. But here she's giving us two contrasting graphs. First of all, with open circles, big game. And again, over time, from 19,000, near the beginning of the Epipaleolithic, through the Epipaleolithic, a declining number of large animals being available to hunt. Yeah? And by contrast, the, the smaller dash line going up from left to right with little black diamonds on it is small game partridges tortoises hares and so forth their numbers increasing quite steeply as they would need to to compensate for the failure of uh, um, the failing numbers of larger game but what I really wanted to um, uh, concentrate on for Natalie Munro's work is uh, her work on what I call the hare and the tortoise because what she's noticed is and it's on this map on this d diagram here uh, that uh, tortoises which the blue arrow is pointing to here, which is the dark bar in these graphs, were um, quite a significant animal amongst the small animals, amongst the birds, hares, fox, and so forth. Tortoises were much the most uh, uh, common uh, animal if you go back to the Middle Paleolithic. Yeah? So in the Middle Paleolithic, people were capturing tortoises in preference to birds and hares and fox and so forth. Yeah? Um, and, uh, uh, but the thing is that over a period of time, the tortoise remains um, sustainable. Now, tortoises are easy to catch, 
Yeah? Most of us can catch up with the tortoise, yeah? <coughs> um, um, but they're very, very slow to reproduce and mature. Yeah? So it's very easy to hunt them out. Yeah? So the implication is that population levels in the middle Paleolithic are very low because numbers of tortoise, big tortoise, fully grown tortoise, just goes on and on and on. Yeah? Uh, um, but you can see that once we get into the, well into this diagram, the upper three bars represent the Epipaleolithic, uh, then uh, things change, yeah? and uh, birds increase. So tortoises are becoming overhunted. In other words, population density is rising. Yeah? The tortoises are getting hunted out, people are compensating by catching birds, and then further on up the grass in the latest levels, hunting hare and fox. And for a long time, the number of fox bones turning up on late Epipaleolithic early Neolithic sites worried zoologists. What, what's, what's going on? People wouldn't be eating foxes. Are they hunting foxes because they're competing with them for capturing partridge and hare? They're just knocking them out. But if they're just knocking them out, hunting them, why are they bringing them? Or maybe they're bringing them back for the fox pelts. It's now quite clear they were being hunted for meat. Yeah? They were being hunted for meat. Shortly after this stage, in the very early Neolithic, we see the first signs of animal domestication. This map shows, with a light-coloured contour, the approximate distribution in the wild at 20,000, 10,000 years ago of wild goat, the, the range of wild goat. There's a number of archaeological sites there, and if you're close enough to read the percentages underneath, it tells you what percentage of the animals uh, at that site were goat, were wild goat. So there's a series of sites there where people were using wild goat and the, the theory is, <coughs> excuse me, the theory is that, the, that where goats were most depended on is where they're likely to have been most, uh, most likely to have been domesticated and that is where the darker contour is in western Iran. And indeed that's where we have the earliest date for domesticated goat. By very little, maybe 100, 200 years. Around 8,500, 8,300, 8,200 BC, goat is, is uh, um, domesticated. And depends which country you work in uh, and which university you're from as to where you, whether you think yours is earlier than theirs. But this is the evidence from that site of Ganjdari in western Iran. Um, the um, American uh, PhD student who worked on this found that the um, width of uh, this particular bone in the goat, you can see it's one of the leg bones, measured at two different places, width A versus width B, gives him this graph. And you can see there's a, uh, there's a, a, a nice line of uh, uh, increase. And um, the, the, um, you would expect in a population of goats for the males to be bigger than the females. So the orange dots towards the upper right ought to be males and the black dots down towards the left ought to be females. Yeah? But so what's interesting about this is that the predominantly the largest animals are immature. In other words, the males, and this is bad news for all the men in the audience, the males are being culled yeah? because you don't need many. If you're overwintering the animals, you overwinter the females yeah? because you're, you're breeding from them. Yeah? You don't need too many, too many males in a, in, in a, a farmed uh, herd of uh, animals. So here's the evidence that by about 8,300, 8,200 BC at Ganjdare, wild goats have been taken fully under control, yeah? and young males are being taken out when they're nice and big, making very good meat, yeah? but before they have any of the joys of life. Yeah? <laughs> uh, and females uh, are, are, uh, are reaching maturity. Only females are reaching maturity. So there we have. Uh, the, the signs of um, goat domestication, sheep domestication, the signs are that, that, was that sheep were domesticated about the same time, 8,300, a little before maybe 8,500 BC, in southeast Turkey, northern Syria. There's the cluster of, of uh, sites with a dark contour around it where the proportions of wild uh, sheep are um, concentrated. Um, high proportions of wild sheep are concentrated and where we have the earliest evidence for sheep domestication. That is a wild sheep at the top. The fleece on the sheep are put, is, a, is a, a, um, a characteristic which has been bred in since uh, uh, domestication. 
And that's why wild sheep are, uh, and domesticated sheep are so different to tell from uh, uh, goats. They're, so they're extremely similar in their anatomy, their bones. <coughs> the diagram that's just popped up shows us uh, the changing size of uh, sheep. The, near the top of the diagram are early sites, near the bottom of the diagram are later sites, and size is increasing from right to left on these diagrams. Yeah? So at the top of the graph, we've got, top of the uh, table, we've got wild animals, uh, and uh, we can see the changing size. They're getting um, sm smaller with domestication. That's right, sorry, they're getting smaller with domestication. Yeah? Uh, and you can see that the change in size. Again, it's not a snap that they suddenly change. It's a process which takes uh, time. Cattle domestication has always been a real problem. There's a cluster of sites uh, here, uh, and um, unfortunately their names have uh, got the wrong colour on them so that they, they don't uh, uh, show up. But it's a cluster of sites in southeast Turkey and one in just over the border in Syria. Uh, and uh, they've all got cattle bones, they were all uh, French excavations or French um, zoologists worked on the bones and uh, a French uh, zoologist Daniel Elmer has done the key work uh, on this uh, because these are all animals from within one area so variation is not going to be uh, in size is not going to be due to variation in environment it's going to be variation in, in uh, treatment over time and the, the group of sites covers a period of time so he produced a, uh, this graph, and I'll make sense of it for you with some arrows. The solid black line with the two very, very uh, tall humps in it is uh, wild animals. In cattle, you get very strong, particularly in the wild, very strong differentiation between the sexes, called sexual dimorphism. Bulls are much bigger than cows. So if you get a profile like this from your um, cattle bones uh, with two very distinct humps, you're, you've got wild cattle, people are hunting wild cattle. At 9000 BC, one of the sites is producing that graph. Yeah. At 8500 BC, another of the sites uh, is uh, close by, not very far away, is producing a quite different prof profile. Still got two humps in it, uh, but they're, they're uh, uh, getting closer together in, in size. The bulls are not significantly, not so much larger than the, uh, the females. Yeah. And then at 8,300 BC, a smooth curve. And again, that will happen when the bull calves are being taken out, are being culled in a domesticated herd. Yeah? Because you don't need to carry many bulls over the winter, you want to carry the females over the winter. So somewhere between 9,000 and 8,300 BC, cattle have been domesticated in southeast Turkey, northern Syria. But we also know that because they appear in Cyprus before 8300 BC. Yeah? They still look wild from the size of the bones, yeah? uh, but presumably they were domesticated because I wouldn't like to share a small boat going over from Syria to Cyprus uh, with a breeding stock of wild cattle. <laughs> In the last couple of minutes, let's just pull together what we've seen. The first thing to say is that the beginnings of farming is the end of a process that goes back at least 10, 12,000 years. Broad spectrum strategies began to be employed at the upper Paleolithic, Epipaleolithic boundary at the time of the last glacial maximum, 20,000, 23,000 years ago. That meant the investment of more labor, skill, equipment in hunting, trapping, and fishing, for which the returns were disproportionately small compared to the hunting of large, herd ungulates. It similarly meant a serious concentration on harvesting nutritious hard-seeded species including wheat, barley and rye, lentils, peas, chickpeas, vetches. While the actual plant remains are scarce on epipaleolithic sites, we have a proxy indicator in the form of heavy groundstone equipment for grinding and pounding the stored seeds. While there were a few grinding stones on sites of the Upper Paleolithic period, the numbers begin to grow through the Epipaleolithic. They take a jump at the end of the Epipaleolithic and another big jump in the early Neolithic. We also have silica gloss from cutting the, the stems of, of uh, wild grasses, cereals. Uh, it glosses um, the, uh, the blades which are used for cutting, so we have the silica gloss on small blades, sickle blades, and likewise that increases in quantity um, during the Epipaleolithic, 
uh, and is even more common in the early Neolithic. And we've also seen that there are signs of increasing stress on wild plant resources through the Epipaleolithic and becoming particularly serious at the end of the Epipaleolithic. Plants at Abu Huraira, in the, uh, the work of Simon Davis on, on Israeli sites, on gazelle and on, uh, in other animals. Culminating in evidence for the appearance of domesticated rye at Abu Huraira and uh, uh, culminating elsewhere with the first domesticated cereals in the early uh, uh, ninth or even late 10th millennium uh, BC uh, and uh, uh, domesticated animals by around 8,500 BC. While many people have gained the idea that the Jordan Valley or the Southern Levant is the cradle of the first farmers, the general information that we have at present suggests that domestication of wheat, chickpeas, cattle and sheep were concentrated much further north in southeast Turkey, in uh, the upper valleys of the Euphrates and the Tigris, in north Syria, uh, uh, and with goat uh, perhaps far round as, as uh, west, uh, western Iran. Um, and all this evidence, I'm afraid, is, is uh, widely neglected, but it's there. It's in, the, it's in the literature, some of it quite recently, but some of it for quite a long time. Full domestication of both plants and animals appeared in the early Neolithic by 8500 BC or so. Within a century or two, mixed farming was being practiced all around the hilly flanks of the Fertile Crescent. Farming is currently being documented in central Anatolia at very much the same time. And as I've just said, there were farming communities in Cyprus by at least 8300 BC, we now know. And that is new. While the process that brought farming into practice may have been lengthy, over 10,000 years, the spread of the practice of mixed farming within Southwest Asia, by contrast, was very rapid. From its inception, the mixed farming economic strategy was expansionist. And the final point is that the long process of change in subsistence strategies leading to the domestication of plants and animals took place and across uh, several contrasting climatic phases. We've been talking about time periods which stretch from the last glacial maximum through the recovery period which itself had a series of oscillations in it, through the Younger Dryas into the um, Neolithic period, which was part of a, a, an early Holocene climatic optimum. Yeah? And it's in the climatic optimum period that domestication takes place. Yeah? Uh, therefore, it seems to me, the facts uh, don't really fit the idea of climatic and environmental change pushing people into uh, the first domestication of either plants or animals. The facts as we have them would fit much better with a picture of increasing population density. And when we look at the settlements of the Epipaleolithic and the early Neolithic in the next lecture, we shall see that there is good evidence for population growth. So I look forward to seeing you after lunch. Go and hunt and gather. <laughs>